morning everyone it is 10 o'clock it's friday and um <clears throat> well we're here together again um uh we're gonna be in uh psalms 14 but the the interesting aspect as i was wrestling with psalm 14 um even last night and into today uh i'm just gonna ask the question as we go through this uh, I got, we got to wrestle with this idea of, of David and, and who he is because he, he talks in such a profound way about um, the righteous and, and the ungodly and the evil and, and how you know he wants God to put an end to all of this and um, and I just struggle with some of those aspects so we're gonna we're gonna look at that today so hope you're doing well uh, it is good to see you looking forward to um, talking with you a little bit more today about the Bible. And, uh, and what God's doing in my heart. Good morning, Candy. Good to see you. Good morning, Steve. Um, we are, uh, I, I'm anticipating and, and hope, hopefully, uh, you know, hoping that this May 4th uh, deadline will begin to see some ch some movement and some changes there going forward that, um, you know, we're going to, we're going to be able to in um, honor the government, start moving, moving back into church meetings and, and doing that stuff together. Um, so I'm, I'm very excited about that. Um, I had a great day yesterday. I just, I got to share with you guys at some point I'll, I'll, I'm hoping to be able to post some pictures and show you kind of what, what I did yesterday and some of the fun that I had. Um, but, uh, part of how I deal with life, part of my, my daily routine, uh, not daily routine, but it's part of how I, how I deal with stress and I deal with life and all those things. Um, good morning, Leslie. Uh, see you guys, our way is, uh, Randy and uh, Kay and Dick Olson. Good to see you guys. Thanks for joining us this morning. Um, but you guys know I'm kind of a motorhead. I, I know it's hard to tell. Um, it's on this side, uh, but, but a lot of my clothes have got, you know, forward on them and, and, or Mustang or something along that line. In fact, I probably have, yeah, I have my hat. It's sitting right here. So it, it's, it's just, it, you know, it's part of my personality and it's, it's part of, uh, what I do. And so part of yesterday, um, I, uh, we bought a, a, a performance part for the, the car. It's, it's kind of one of the ways in which I, um, unload it's, it's how I, I decompress in life. And so I was out in the shop yesterday for a couple of hours, tinkering on the car and just had a, had a great day. Um, you know, it was able to get that done and, and worked on that process and, and saw success in that. And, uh, and it actually came together very, very well. And so just super thrilled about that. Um, and yet in that, in that, in that moment, in that, um, energy and excitement of doing that stuff, I was really wrestling with, uh, just the message yesterday of, uh, you know, man, am I really rejoicing in the Lord for these things? Am I grateful for the bountiful ways, uh, in which God has dealt with me? And, and so, um, I had a really fun time, a unique time uh, yesterday tinkering on my car and realizing what a gift, uh, God has given me, um, in the ability one it, with a bride who will, allows me to tinker on cars. Cause, um, you know, it's, it's really not her passion. She, she, um, is so, um, loving and kind and, and, um, and caring towards me. She, she recognizes how I, how I deal with life well. And so in those moments, you know, in, 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 Engaging me in that area. In fact, she even came out and had, you know, started the car for me because I was filming a little bit of it. And so she started the car and moved it for me. I mean, just goofy little things like that. Um, but it was a good day. It was, it was just a good day of unwinding and unplugging from that, uh, from just the normal, normal stuff. And, and it's how I process. So what a, what a great day, what a good day. Um, and, and a blessing it was for me. So <clears throat> Let me share with you one of the things that I so greatly appreciate about our little church uh, in Liberty Lake is that um, I've only had, I think, in my life, probably two churches that have really just said, be yourself. Just, you know, be the quirky, goofy kid that you are um, with your, you know, stumbling over words at times and sometimes making up words or not saying things right. Um my even trying to read the Bible, how I, I don't read real well. And so I'll stumble over words. Or I'll have to correct it. Um, being a little goofy, finding humor in goofy things. Um, sometimes feeling a little unreligious, like where, where I struggle with 
um, with religion at times. In fact, I've had people who have who um, have engaged me in the world and say, I really don't like the church. And I said, man, I got to I got to be honest with you. I, I kind of don't like the church either. Um, and God has has really worked in my heart in that area um, to love the church. But but this Liberty Lake Church, the family life that we have there has been such a blessing to me um, because I feel like I feel like we're at a spot where um, God has put me in a place and he said, go be yourself. And you as a church have embraced that and said, you know what, we're okay with that. And um, just go be yourself and follow the Lord. And so that's part of what this morning is going to be about. Um, as I was reading through uh, Psalm 14, uh, something just hit me. <clears throat> I guess, I don't know, in, a, in a, just a real tangible way to say, man, Shane, what does it mean to be a man after God's own heart? Because, you know, we see David in this in this process in this posture in the Psalms that is, um, you know, um, he's proclaiming the banner of the Lord at times and asking God to bring justice and, and to bring, <clears throat> to bring his judgment on those who are unfaithful, those who are evil or, or who are not righteous, who are not living the way that they are. And, um, so we're going to take a, just a real brief journey through David's life and wrestle with um, what I wrestled with actually very uh, probably about 15 years ago um, as, as my marriage came uh, really the, the potential was for my marriage to end um, sin in my life exposed and uh, and God just overhauling my heart to say you know that 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 the lifestyle I was living what I thought was church what I thought was Christianity um, was not acceptable and uh that, that God wasn't going to leave me there in this kind of religious practice where where I was hiding sin and 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 living two different lives, and um, by the grace of God, my bride <clears throat> stayed with me and was committed to our marriage, committed to God's plan, and and through a, a process of of meaningful and difficult restoration. Um, I think I can say, and my bride would echo this, uh, that that we have um, our marriage is the best it's ever been. Our relationship is deeper and more meaningful than it's ever been, um, and it's just a, an amazing gift from God. Uh, and so, to be at this church and to have you guys uh, say, "Man, we love you just the way you are," and 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 we're gonna we're gonna walk with the Lord together um, in all of our goofiness, it's just such a blessing. And and so as we wrestle with this this morning, um, I, I just want you to, to know that uh, <clears throat> this is one of the challenges that I've run into in my life, wrestling with this whole concept, concept of what does it mean to be a man after God's own heart? Um, and I spent a lot of time um, early on in, in our marriage restoration process just struggling with that. And, and then um, so I want to share with you some of the stuff that, that has grabbed my heart um, and and how I think we're we should consider this or we should look at this as we go forward um, in the days and weeks ahead as God <clears throat> reinstates the church into our into our normal practice of church fellowship and hopefully has called us out of our normal practice of, of godly relationship into a deeper more meaningful relationship with Him. So good morning, Kathleen. Good to see you. Thanks for joining us. Let me share on a side note. As you're opening your Bibles to Psalm 14, I really want to encourage you that if this is not a practice in your life, if you are not making um, a studying of God's Word on a morning, on a daily basis, <clears throat> I want to encourage you to do that. But even more than that, I want to challenge you to consider the the idea of wrestling with a text and then finding someone to share it with and, and to kind of do what I'm doing here where where I'm just sharing my thoughts, I'm sharing my heart, I'm wrestling with how what this means and how it applies to my life. How would we look at this and, and apply it to um, our daily living? Um, because I am growing so much in this time. And part of it is just the wrestling with how do I share this, Lord? How do I, how do I engage this in a way that's meaningful? And, and how do we apply uh, uh, application, appropriate application to this text so that we can live in a way that reflects the truth that we see? So I always say this, I think everybody should have to preach at least once in their life because you'll never learn more than when you're preparing it to try and share it with someone else. So I like to uh, share the suffering. And it's amazing and good. <clears throat> 
So uh, Psalm 14, let's jump in and begin this morning. <clears throat> this is a psalm to the choir master of David, and it says this, verse 1, Psalm 14, The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They are abominable deeds. Uh, they do abominable deeds. There is none who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. Have they no knowledge? All the evildoers who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon the Lord? There, uh, there they are in great terror. For God is with the generation of the righteous. You would shame the plans of the poor, but the Lord is his refuge. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores the fortunes of his people, let Jacob rejoice, let Israel be glad. Do you see the question he's asking? Is, is there any who do good? None. There's none. And how do we how do we deal with that? How do we address that? Because David, even in the psalm, talks about um, the righteous and, and that God is with them. God's, God's going to put to shame the plans of, of the evil. He's going to judge them. He's going to He's going to actually overturn them um, and restore the fortunes of Israel, restore the fortunes of the righteous. So good morning, Cindy. Good to see you guys. Thanks for joining us. Um, and when I read these things, what, what was in my heart, and again, you guys, you have to understand that as I'm processing this, I'm, I'm my mind goes all over the place. That's part of what is a challenge for me is to keep focused on the text. And that's why I like to teach through books of the Bible and not just do my own um my own uh, uh, topical teaching because I can get really I can get really off track quick and topical because my my mind just goes all over the place. But as I was reading this this morning and I've been wrestling with this all week, as David talks about his him being righteous and God responding to him because of his right because he's right before God because he's following him because he's a child of God. Um, he's one of the children of Israel and, and therefore, um, you know, called of God or, 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 or the, the elect. And I just, I, I'm like, okay, so is that true? Can, you know, is David really righteous? Is David, is David really that, that man after God's own heart? Does he really follow the Lord? Um, and we're going to look at it. I want to look at a couple of texts, a different text. We're just going to go on a, on a short journey today through this process. So start turning in your Bibles to Acts. Um, I think it's Acts chapter 13. Yeah, Acts 13, 22. I want you got to see this. It's, it's, it's kind of amazing. Because here we see... Um, Oh, I went to Romans. That's not going to help me. That would have been a little different, a little different uh, warning there. Here we see Paul and Barnabas, and they're given the story. They're they're um, telling about this this process, and, and he's preaching to. He actually says in verse uh, sixteen there. He says, "Men of Israel, and you who fear God, listen." He, he's he's opening up this this sermon. And, and this moment of teaching with the people of Israel and men who fear God. So he that's that's the group that he's talking to. And he begins to tell them the story of Israel all the way back from, he goes all the way back to their 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 fathers um, and, and the idea of them being made a great people coming out of Egypt. So he takes them from the time of Egypt and the promise of their fathers and how he grew them from being very insignificant, being one family into being the nation of Israel that is redeemed by God out of Egypt out of Egypt, that he put up with them for this number of years, that he went, took them through the land of Canaan, destroyed all, all these, uh, I think it was seven nations that he actually references here. Um, and, and it says it took about 450 years. And then the judges came and then Samuel came and then the people asked for a king and, and they got Saul. And after 40 years, God removed him. And then he brought in David. And this is where we pick up in uh, uh, chapter 13 of Acts, verse 22. And when he had removed him, that is Saul, he said, he raised up David to be their king, of whom he testified and said, I have found in David, the son of Jesse, a man after my heart who will do all my will. So this is this is God saying that when he set up David, I have found a man after my own heart who will do my will, who's going to obey what I've called him to do, live in obedience uh, to God's will, to God's law, to his purposes. Now, here's the question. 
Uh, good morning, Michelle. Good to see you. Here's the question. Did he do that? Is that, is, it, I mean, if we look at David's life, would you look back at, at his life and, and all of those things and say, oh yeah, absolutely. David was a man after God's own heart. He did the will of the Lord. And it's many, many levels he did. <clears throat> I think that there are lots of examples of where he actually did uh, live in obedience to the Lord. He followed him. He trusted him. <clears throat> the times where he could have killed Saul and he, he didn't, he stopped his men from doing it. Um, th there's just a, a number of things that you see where David did well. He, he, he um, engaged the Lord. He asked uh, the Lord what to do, and then he followed those directions. I mean, there are some really great pictures of David following the Lord. Again, side note, this is my coffee um, that I uh, Randy uh, brought by and dropped off for me at the church, and so I'm doing it. I love the vanilla nut, Randy. It's good stuff. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I said, shameless, shameless plug. If you have a coffee brand that you really love that you would like me to try and tell everybody about, you know, you can send them over to me, and that's horrible and kind of funny all at the same time. So I don't, don't send me coffee. I'm just. That was that was the humor side of me that all of a sudden it popped into my head, and I'm probably distracting all of us from what we're talking about. So back to the text. We have in David this this great picture um, and this proclamation that God made of, of him being a man after my own heart. He found in David to be a, a man after his own heart who is willing to do his will. And then we get the Bathsheba, right? We get to Bathsheba, and we get to Uriah, and we get to this whole mess where, where the, and we know the story. We, we won't read all of it today, but I want to read you a passion when Nathan comes to David and confronts him. Because there's there's deep, meaningful things in this, and then there, there's aspects of this that are, um, that we should really wrestle with in our heart. We should, we should engage them in our hearts, and we should, we should, contend with this and say, God, is this me? Let me read this, read the, the text to you. And, and I think you'll understand more. Um, second Samuel chapter 12, second Samuel chapter 12, starting in verse one, the text says this, uh, second Samuel 12, one, <clears throat> and the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, there were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe, lamb, which he had bought. And he brought it up and grew it up with him and with his children. It used to eat his morsels and drink from his cup and lie in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guest who had come to him, but he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Verse 7, Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul. And I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if this were too little, I would add to you as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with a sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword shall not depart from your house because you have despised me and you have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own household and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbors. And he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. Nevertheless, because by this deed you have utterly scorned the Lord, the children, the child who is born to you shall die. Then Nathan went to his house. And if we follow the story, you guys, you'll actually see David is lamenting. He's crying out to the Lord to, to have mercy on this child, to, to, to let his judgment pass on this child. Um, and, and it's, 
it's an amazing story and you need to go in and read it um you know to finish the story but but it's it's crazy what's happening here david sin he he's he's killed uriah he got uh, he, he went and took Bathsheba before Uriah was dead and, and slept with her, got her pregnant, violated the law of God, did all of this stuff, despised the word of the Lord. He did all of these things. And now he's living in that sin without having repented. And Nathan has to come and confront him because of the sin that's in his life, because of this unrepentant sin. And Nathan tells him the story and David responds to that and says, I have sinned against the Lord. He he cries out from his heart about the sin that is that is prevalent that, that is present in his life that is unrepentant. And it's interesting in verse uh, of thirteen where Nathan says to David, "The Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die." But the consequences of this are profound, and and the child dies. It's 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 bitter and hard. And then there's. There's all kinds of consequences for the rest of David's life because of this sin. Now, if you're like me, I, I look at this and I'm like, okay, so how does God say that he's a man after his own heart who will do his will? Because if you look here, he's blown it up, right? I think the, I think the key element to this is David's response to the sin when he's confronted. You and I all struggle with it, with us, right? We have sin in our lives that, that some of it's really obvious. Some of it's just like, oh my, you know, we know that that sin, that, that we just is obvious. We, we can't, we can't ignore it. We know it. I think there's other sin that, that when it's exposed we know it's wrong and we know that we shouldn't be doing it but when it's not exposed when it's in secret somehow we're okay with justifying it somehow we're okay with well it's you know even you take the sins of the world take take um uh greed and and lust and uh, uh you know all the things that we see worshiped in our culture today and it's i think it's hard for us at times to, to acknowledge even in our own lives where we're, where we're doing that, where that's part of, and, and it's an acceptable thing for us. Um, because it's the world, it's totally normal. It's okay, but everywhere else. Um, I think probably over the last 50 to, to 60 years, uh, sexual sin has just become just normal. It's, it's kind of how everybody, it's just okay. Everybody, everybody lives that way. Um, you know, not uh, sex before marriage, moving in together, um, um, the uh, uh, pornography and all of that kind of stuff. I mean, it's just skyrocketed in our culture. Gossip, right? I mean, let's just let's just be really, really brutally honest with us. Gossip in the church is rampant. Um, maybe even maybe even. Um, you know, where we're coveting other people's things, where we want the better job or the bigger house or, or you know, all of the stuff, all, all of the things that come with that. I mean, one of the great temptations in, in the pastoral ministry is this idea of success. And, and if you don't, if you don't, um, you know, have enough people or, or have enough budget, if, if you don't end up with extra staff or you're, you're full, there's all kinds of temptations, even within the ministry to start coveting other people's stuff. My point being this is that there's opportunity for sin everywhere as we engage in our walk with the Lord, as we engage in this process of following God. And in, in what I'm wrestling with in my heart is, am I a man after God's own heart, willing to do his will? Um, am I willing to, to, rightly and, and, and very directly, very honestly assess in my own heart where the sin's at, where the where the self-worship's at, where the idolatry's at, the things that that I worship more than God and I and I allow to have uh, prominence and 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 dominion in my life to rule over my heart. Am I willing to look at those things and address them and then respond to them like David? I mean, you got to look at Psalm 51. You, you can't talk about the sin of David without looking at Psalm 51 because that that's the psalm in which he writes and responds to what he sees in his heart out of this time, right? 
Psalm 51, 1, he says this, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. In the first two verses, he's crying out to the Lord saying, God, be merciful to me because I'm, I'm wretched. I'm wrecked. Look at this. Look at the, the, the mess in my life. You know it. You're aware of it. You're, you're above it. You knew this was coming. All of these things. And he's saying, you're the one that can purify me. You're the one that can actually remove this from my life to cleanse me from sin. And then verse three, he says, for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me against you. And you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. David acknowledges his flawed, sinful nature. And that in its current condition, in its present condition, outside of God engaging and purifying and bringing mercy, that, that he's incapable of, of, of being this man that God's called him to be. And I, I really feel like that's the key is it's, it's not about us flawlessly um, living this life. Uh, David did not flawlessly live in obedience or obey the will of God. But when his sin was exposed, when God as a good father said, look, son, this is, this is what you're doing. This is, this is the sin in your life. This is what you have to address. When, when that was exposed, when, when the blackness of his heart was brought to light, David fell on his face and confessed his sin before the Lord. You know, we're called in 1 John 1, 9 to confess our sins. And if we do, God being righteous will forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And, and so it's, it's, not like, it's not like in this process that when sin is exposed, when, when we see it in our lives, that there's, um, you know, a massive parade of shame like King David had. I mean, did you see that in, in, in 2 Samuel? His, his shame, his sin, the consequences are going to be lived out in the, in the public eye. The, the, the nation's going to see the consequences of his sin. And I think because, for the purposes of helping the rest of the nation to say, man, we don't want to live this way. We, we don't want to live that way. God, help us not to be that. But the key, I, I believe, to having a heart after God is that when we see our sin, we, we confess it. We fall on our face before God. We lament the reality of our, our battle in the flesh, between the flesh and the spirit, and, and that we engage it and say in, 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 in real, open, honest terms, God, I'm undone. How can you how can I be a man after your own heart when this is the behavior that I choose? Forgive me, Lord. Cleanse me, purify me, show mercy on me, train me up. I, I love I love how David continues in the psalm. He says, purge me or, or, or cleanse my sin um, with, with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sin and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit in me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Uphold me with a willing spirit he acknowledges and he falls on his face before God. And he says, God, you're the one that can do this. You are the one that brings clarity, purity. You're the one that brings joy. You're the one that brings salvation. You're the one that restores the broken. You restore the, the, the unclean heart. You can actually take, take the blackness of my heart and create a new one in me and, and restore me in, in joy in, in, in my relationship with you. You're the one that does this, do that in me. And then I love how he ends this. Then I will teach your teach transgressors your way, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood thirst, from the blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. Open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praises, for you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. God does not despise. Is that the condition of our hearts? You guys, as we look at 
at the word of God, as we engage the word of God, as we look to see who it is that we are, who it is that God has called us to be, who it is that that the 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 battles of our flesh, the battles of of the the spirit and and the old nature, um, the which where we choose from morning to morning to be. Is it that we have a contrite, a broken and contrite heart? Are we on our face before God, confessing our sin and crying out for his mercy, trusting in his grace and salvation uh, and, and his the work that Jesus did on the cross? I believe that that's the key. That is one of the great, the, the key to this idea of, of being a man or a woman after God's own heart is that when we see this, when we read the word of God, when our brothers or sisters confront us on an issue, that we would fall on our face and confess our sins before the Lord and cry out and depend on him. What does it mean to be a man after God's own heart? I guess to sum it up, I would say it's to see sin as sin. To see God as God. And to recognize our own failures and fall on our face before him. Confessing our sin and depending on his work on the cross. To purify us and to make us right before him. I want to challenge you that there's great freedom in that. There's great hope in that. The church has a long ways. We have a lot to learn in being broken and contrite in our heart and confessing our sins to one another and being transparent and living life, acknowledging that sin, it matters. That, that, that sin is a big deal and grace is big enough to bring forgiveness, but God says, you've got to confess it. We have to acknowledge it. We have to, we have to repent and turn to the Lord. We have to acknowledge that, that the sin in our life, if it's undealt with it, 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 it remains and there's consequences. We cannot just live like it doesn't matter. There's, there's no value in grace. If sin is not, if sin is not a real issue. What's, what's the value in salvation if our sin's no big deal? Brothers and sisters, we've got to take this seriously. I want to challenge you as the text has been rest, working me over even today. What does it mean to be a man or woman after God's own heart? Pursue the Lord. Fall on your face before God today. Confess the sin that's there. And if you need to know where, where you can find whether or not you're dealing with that, grab Galatians. Um, Start there. Go through, read, read Romans, the first couple chapters of Romans. Let God work over your heart through the book of Romans. And when you see something in the text that is in contrast or contrary to what your heart is doing, exercise 1 John 1, 9 and confess it and return to the Lord. Man, it's been great to have you. Love you guys. Uh, God bless and keep your eyes on him today. Um, as we pursue him and we look for him uh, to restore our, our fellowship and our gathering together very, very soon. God bless you. Have a good day. Bye.